Our first song this morning will be number 682. To God be the glory, number 682. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. It great to hear praise the Lord. We're able to do it together. We're grateful for that. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we're truly grateful for the privilege we have of being here together today to worship Thee, the only true and living God. And Father, we're truly thankful for all of the, the ones that we have here that are our guests, and we're grateful, Father, for that. We're thankful, Father, for the time of, the, of year that we have now, the holidays we have, the Christmas times. It brings people together and brings joy in our hearts, Father, to be able to be with our families and our loved ones and be able to reminisce over the things that, that uh, you have done for us and have blessed us with. And we're grateful for that. And Father, we pray that uh, this joy will continue with us every day and that uh, throughout our, our land that uh, uh, they'll always remember Jesus every day and not just on special times as this. And Father, we're thankful that we can be here today and worship Thee, and we pray that we'll be directed by Your Word, Father. Continue to help us every day to serve You in, in the capacities that we're able to do, and all of us and join together and helping to spread the gospel to those that need to hear it and need to be saved. And Father, we are thankful for every, every blessing that you provide for us, and we pray that we'll help return those to others that need our help always. And Father, we are 
we're thankful now that uh, for our preachers that we have and the blessings that they have bring to us and all of the lessons and we look forward father today to the lessons from them that help us to serve you every day of our lives continue with us father help us always to live so heaven can be our home after we after we leave this life and we want to pray these things now in the name of Jesus amen Itself. We have a special time of giving. We'll sing number 565, first verse of Savior that I love before our time of giving. morning. Uh, I hear there's a holiday today, okay, that um, we don't generally mention sometimes from the pulpit because we know this is not necessarily Christ's birthday. It's not his birthday, uh, probably not, but we know it was sometime in 365 days of the year we know it was in there somewhere. And we know that uh, we think of these things. Christ's name is in the word Christmas. And at this time of year, there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of different things that people have and celebrate things in maybe ways they shouldn't. But we know that now's a time that we come before the Lord and we think what he's given us. Take a moment and to stop and take a deep breath and think about your breathing, just exhale and inhale, and realize the gift that God has given you in just being able to do such a thing. Now's the time that we can come to him just like the, the wise men came. Uh, we, they celebrate that there's three. We don't know that. There's just three gifts that are mentioned. But they came, and in Matthew 2, starting in verse 11, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented it unto him, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, we might be wearing some gold. We might be wearing some, some frankincense and a little bit of myrrh somewhere in, a, in, a, in our colognes or perfumes. But now's the time that we have a different kind of gift that we bring to him and he's directed that we use it for a particular purpose and that is to support the church and to bring more to him. And so at this time, I'd like to offer a prayer and let's present our gifts unto the Lord. Father, thank you so much for all that you do and all you've given. We now know what the people of ancient times didn't know. They only could blindly look towards. But we see and we know these gifts that you've given us are so far outshadow anything that we could present or try to give back. Bless us and keep us and forgive us of our sins. And it's through Jesus we pray. 
Come here. Two hundred and fifty. If you would like to stand as we sing, how sweet, how heavenly, for our lesson. How sweet, how heavenly. have a lot of beautiful smiling faces here today. We need to remember uh, in our prayers, especially uh, Christian Montague, I, I was just told that, uh, keep sweet Christian in our prayers as he's uh, having more seizures than, than normal. Every year, on December 25th, millions, if not billions, of people 
celebrate Christmas. Christmas means different things to different people. Many celebrate this day as the birth of Christ, even though, uh, as Eddie mentioned, uh, Jesus' birthday did not occur uh, most likely near the time of December or January, but probably somewhere closer to uh, the fall. Christians must understand that God authorizes only the things that he has commanded us to do. Therefore, we celebrate Christmas uh, in a way... Well, we, we, don't, we don't focus when we celebrate Christmas on the, the birth of Christ because, well, God has not commanded us to do that. Uh, people often call the Christmas season a time of joy, a time of love, a time of goodwill, and other things. Often you will see signs calling Jesus uh, the reason for the season. I would like to talk to you this morning about Jesus. Not because of any holiday that we might celebrate on this day, but because we should always talk about Jesus. In fact, I would like us to think about Jesus, the reason for every season. Jesus, the reason for every season. Let us notice three aspects of Jesus that we should talk about during every season of the year. First, we will examine Jesus the word. Second, we will focus on Jesus, the wise. And finally, we will shift our attention to Jesus, the wonderful. First, notice Jesus, the word. In ancient Greek times, the Stoics, followers of the teacher Zeno, used the word logos, translated word in our Bibles, to speak of an animating power pervading all physical existence. They believed that this logos, or divine reason, as they called it, caused all movement and activity. Thus, reason itself, according to them, gave the universe order. To them, it surrounds us, penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. The Stoics would have identified reason as the reason for every season. Three to four hundred years later, a man named Jesus walked the earth. Jesus taught many lessons. He performed many miracles. Jesus established his church on the day of Pentecost, nearly two months after he walked out of a rich man's tomb. However, the Apostle John calls Jesus so much more than simply a man who did these things. John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John began his book by speaking about this word, or logos. And the word dwelt with God in the beginning, not as a subordinate to God, but equal with God himself. Can we equate this word with Jesus? Well, look, on, look farther down the chapter in verse 14. It says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word became someone that humanity could see, someone that humanity could experience. How did this happen? Well, the angel told Joseph about this about his wife Mary. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21 Thus, Jesus, whom inspired John identified as the Logos, divinity, who dwelt face to face with God in the beginning, created the world, filled it with life, then the word... Reason itself came to this earth as a human being. We must identify Jesus not just as the reason for this season, but as the reason, the Logos, responsible for every season. Notice Hebrews 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person 
and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I want you to focus on that phrase, upholding all things by the word of his power. What does that mean? Well, not only did Jesus create the world, but he sustains it too. Everything we do then, regardless of what season we find ourselves in, we do because of the sustaining power of Christ. Colossians 1.17, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Thus Jesus created us, Jesus sustains us. Every season then, Jesus, reason himself, has created. Next, let us notice Jesus the wise. Jesus the wise. The book of Proverbs portrays wisdom as a woman crying out in the streets for people to listen and to pay heed. Proverbs 1, 20 through 23. Wisdom cries without. She uttereth forth her voice, or she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of gates. In the city she utters her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Wisdom wants us to listen. Wisdom wants us to pay attention. Now, wisdom does not exist as an entity that thinks or feels. It cannot call out, not literally, in the streets. But we... But we see God using a literary device, personification, to help us heed his wide, wise words. Wisdom tells us, obey God. Listen to his words. Today, wisdom still calls out to us. But do you know, we see wisdom take shape in the person in the life, and in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, Jesus lived a wise life. You can see that Jesus began very early with, his, with wisdom. In Luke 2.52, the Bible records that Jesus increased in wisdom, as well in, as stature, as well as growing in favor with God and with man. But he increased in wisdom, and he began this at a very young age. Then, after he began his ministry, he taught in such a way that, that made people marvel, that made people, well, they, that made people amazed. Matthew 7. 28 and 29, and it came to pass. Great, and, and we see this, this, these verses at the end of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus came, and in one sermon, he preached what would take the rest of us preachers a year at least. But he stated so many great things in this sermon. And when he finished, imagine the people sitting there having just heard this. What did they think? Well, the Bible tells us what they thought. The Bible tells us that they understood that they didn't just listen to a normal teacher. Not one of the scribes or the Pharisees that, that taught on a normal occasion. They had just listened to somebody wise beyond normal wisdom. Matthew seven twenty eight and 29 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. 
a scribe would quote uh, somebody else. Well, rabbi, this rabbi taught this way about this subject. Jesus said, you've heard that it's been said, but I say unto you, and he stated his teachings with authority. And the people marveled in amazement at what he had done, at what he had given them. And we still look at his teachings and we marvel at the wisdom that comes down from God through him. Matthew 13, 54, it says, And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues, insomuch that they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Don't we know him? Didn't he come from Joseph and Mary? Don't we know him? Where did he get this wisdom? Jesus taught on an entirely different level. Well, John 7, 17 shows us that Jesus' teaching came directly from God on high. So we know how he got his wisdom. His teaching came from God. Secondly, Jesus shows us true wisdom. Not only did he lead a wise life and teach wise things, but he shows us true wisdom. Colossians 2, 3, in whom, that is in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The world may not understand divine wisdom. Just read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, to the, uh, it, it says that, that uh, the wise, it asks, where are the wise? Where are the scribes? And it says the world considered Christ foolishness, the wisdom of Christ, the gospel of Christ, what he did. They considered that foolishness to die on a cross to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but unto us who are saved, the power of God. They may not understand divine wisdom, but Christ has true wisdom stored with him. Jesus has a treasure trove, a hidden vault of wisdom that he offers freely to everybody. We only have to learn it from him. Jesus told his disciples then, he told them this, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites us to become his disciples. That invitation, or in that invitation, he invites anyone, all who, who are weary and are heavy laden, he says. Anyone he invites to come and to become his disciple. And what does he say? He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We can learn of him. He invites us to become his disciples, to take his yoke, his workload, and to learn from him, to learn wisdom from him, the master teacher. Jesus tells us that he doesn't offer a heavy burden, but he offers us a light one. Now, you can take the teachings that you find in the Bible and, and make them a heavy burden, Memphis School of Preaching is proof of that. <laughs> right, Michael? <laughs> I say that with Brother Clark here, but he knows. Those students have to work. I had to work going through that, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But the message of the gospel itself does not load or does not weigh us down thirdly though jesus teaches us how to live wise lives jesus told his disciples for i've given you an example that you should do as i have done to you specifically in john 13 15 we see jesus giving his disciples an example of service he washed their feet he said i have given you an example 
However, Jesus gave us so many similar examples of how we should live by the perfect life that he lived. We can watch him and understand the ideal. Understand the perfect example. Paul wrote, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. Paul patterned his life after the master. He lived in such a way that others could see and imitate Christ through him. What about us? We should live our lives, we should pattern our lives, rather, after Christ and after his example, so that we might also say, follow me or follow us as we follow Christ. Can you do that? Can you go out into the world as an example of what Christ would do? Did Paul perfectly follow Christ? Will we perfectly follow Christ? I find that a little bit difficult to do, don't you? Christ understands that and he gives us a way where even if we, we mess up, because we all do, even if we mess up, we have forgiveness and a way to continue to walk in fellowship with him. People call Christmas a time of love, a time of giving, a time of joy, a time of goodwill. However, those who follow Christ, we here today will display all of those things all the time, not just during one season of the year. Remember, we see Jesus the reason for every season, not just the reason for this season. And when we imitate Jesus, we don't just do it now, tomorrow, the day after Christmas. Will we stop loving? Will we stop showing the world how joyful Christian or Christianity can make us? No, we won't. How about in March? Who, uh, Shel Silverstein, the crazy poet, he said, no one loves a Christmas tree on March the 25th. <laughs> and he drew a picture of, of a, a dead twig with a bunch of pine needles under it. But everybody should love a, a Christian on March the 25th because we should act the same every day of the year. Take love. Take joy, for example. John 15, 9 through 12, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If ye keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. We must abide in love, and that means loving God and loving others every day of the year. Abide in love. Don't just vacation there, but dwell there all the time. Notice also generosity. Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, not as we therefore have the season to, but as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. In the third place, we have seen Jesus the word, the divine reason for every season. We have seen Jesus the wise, the one after whom we pattern our lives. Let us notice in the third place, Jesus the wonderful. Something or someone wonderful makes people amazed in the biblical sense of the word. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, 
Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied the birth of Christ and gave him many names in this prophecy. These names serve as descriptions of his attributes, descriptions of the things that he would do. Jesus came to this earth and did wonderful things. He lived as a wonderful person, and when people saw him, their jaws dropped in amazement. He went around perform about performing miracles that amazed those that witnessed them. In fact, the Bible uses the term wonder as, the design, as a designation for the miracles that Jesus did. Acts 2.22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. All three of those designations speak of the same thing. Which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Jesus did wonders. Why do people call them wonders? Because when they saw them, it, they made them, uh, they brought about amazement. Matthew 8, 23 through 27, for example. And he, when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Jesus performed a wonder, and it had the intended effect. It caused amazement. Even Jesus' disciples. We should spend our lives showing the world Christ and showing everything amazing that he did. Every day should fill us with joy and awe over the things that Jesus did for us including the miracle of his birth. We don't need to, uh, to feel amazement just on this one day because uh, of Jesus' birth. He came into this world miraculously. But Jesus did so many other things, and we must share that with other people. Jesus came to this earth, he emptied himself of his equality with God. And I believe I, I said this last week. I can't think of a greater sacrifice that you can make than emptying yourself like he did. He became a person like us. Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Do you marvel that he did that? Do you marvel that he went on after coming to this earth to die a humiliating death so that he could take away my sins? So that he could take away your sins. Do you marvel because of that? Philippians 2, 8. Keep going with the passage. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Every day. Every season we should show others Jesus. And we should show them the fantastic things that he has done for us. Philippians 2 continues. Verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus 
every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and the things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice how this passage tells us that every knee should bow and that every tongue should confess the lordship of Christ. We should spread that message. We have the responsibility of preaching that message to the lost and dying of this world so that they can bow their knee so that they can confess Christ's lordship before, before Christ comes back, before they will have to. Every knee will acknowledge him. But when Jesus comes back, the majority who acknowledge him will do so with regret that they didn't do it sooner. Are, have we spread the message, the good news about our Lord? Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This morning we have directed our attention to Jesus, the reason for every season. We saw Jesus, the Word, and how he created and upholds all things. We saw Jesus, the wise, and how he exemplified wisdom in his life, giving us an example so that we can live wisely ourselves. Finally, we saw Jesus, the wonderful, and how the things that he did caused those around him to marvel while giving us something to which we can direct the thoughts of those around us. Jesus commands each of us to obey God the Father. We must each hear the word. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We must have an active faith in Jesus our Lord and God the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We must tell others of our faith. You have this belief. Tell others about it, confessing your belief in Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. We mustn't stop there, though. Just because we believe in Christ, we have to do something about our sins. What do you need to do about your sin? Well, first, you need to repent of your sins. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 tells us that godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation. Not the kind of repentance that you would regret. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Then, once you have repented of your sins, you must have them washed away in the waters of baptism. Acts 2.38. Baptized for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Once you become a Christian, though, you can't stop there. Once you become a follower of Jesus Christ, once we all become that, that we must continue to live faithfully until we die. Faithful unto death, as Revelation 2.10 told us. Do you sit here today in need of the transforming power of the gospel? Or in need to obey the transforming power of the gospel? If you do, if you have any need... Why don't you make that need known as together we stand and sing our invitation song.
Before partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 644. Tis set the feast divine, number 644. Tis set the feast divine, the bread, the fruit of the vine, and the saints commune before the shrine in the supper. good to see so many guests and, and members and visitors both and uh, it's a season where right now I think I see more red on people than you usually see and uh, it's y'all look very good <laughs> one thing with the guests here we uh, are coming to a point in our worship where it's a very precious and important point but to bring it to those that may not understand, the world on a day like today, they see the, the beginning and the entry of the Lord into the world. And what we as Christians, as, as Ryan mentioned, we're not set to worship. You know, the, the, the birth is not the time, to, it's not decreed to be a, uh, necessarily a special time. But if you go down to the other end, that's the one. That's the point. And we live in a society that is uh, celebrity crazed. Uh, you can take a phone and you know, it's called a selfie, and you know everybody's a, a, trying to be a star on the internet and in all kinds of ways a celebrity. And one point I want to ask is. You may not think of yourself this way, but who is the president of your fan club? If you have one, it may not be very big, but we all have a fan club. And who is the president of your fan club? Okay, is it your spouse? They probably know better, okay? If it is it, you know, a, a grandchild, a, a child, is it a, somebody you work with? Is it your probation officer? Is it, you know, who is the president of your fan club? Who knows your best performances and your worst? Who knows the most about you? I put in that that's Christ. That's Jesus. He knows that. And he loves you. And more than just the president of a fan club, if you take it from the world and take it in even deeper, we're very independent in this country. And we don't think of, you know, we don't particularly want to have uh, anybody tell us what to do. But who is your Lord? Who is, who's got the best look out for you and also knows what to tell you? Just as we tell children, do this or don't do that, because we as parents know better. Again, I say that's Jesus. Jesus wasn't just, he wasn't a good man, okay? And people go, what? Because you'll hear people say that. Oh, Jesus, I think he was a good man. He's either a son of God, as he said he was, or he's completely crazy, okay? He's completely a liar and crazy. He's either one thing or he's not, okay? And because of that, he came into the world, and because God is so pure, so perfect, 
we have a tendency that when we do things wrong, we turn the page and try to get on to the next thing and say we're sorry and we just get past it. But something has to pay for it. Something, we had a day like today, somebody has to pay for the bills. You don't, it's just, it has to be done. And God has provided a way to do that. The reason we wear red on a day like today, there's a reason. It represents blood, okay? There's a thing, there's, there's all kinds of little hidden things in life that we and the world is bringing along, and they don't even understand why. But because we're taking it down to the end point, Christ died for us. And we, they, those that are not Christians will look and say, why do you always talk about blood? What's the blood? Because the wages of sin is death. Because God is so pure, he can't be around it, sin. And so, because of that, the bills had to be paid. And Jesus is the one who came and did that. And he instituted a meal. We're in a season and a time where we are going to be eating a lot and enjoying a lot. But Jesus boiled it down to the essence of one moment. And we do this every week. And there's a reason, because we're focusing on what he has done for us. If we look in Matthew 26, I'm going to start in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He said, eat it. Take it in and get it. He said, drink it. Drink all of it. We don't just sip a little bit of Christ. We're to drink it in. And so at this time, for those that may not be aware and for those that are, we focus on what he has given us, and we participate in this Lord's Supper. Father, thank you so much, so much for all that you give us, for the things that occur around us that we don't even see, that we don't even realize the blessings. Open those things to us that we may see the awe and the amazement and the wonder of all that you've given us, and particularly for giving us our sins through Christ who shed his blood. And we take this cup as representative of that. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we also come and we know that you bless us with this meal, with this time, and we, we eat with those that love us and we love, and we know this is the case here. Father, thank you so much for the broken body and the, the blood that was shed for us, and we ask that you take this to the nourishment of our souls, that we may be one with you, and it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we'll be led in a closing prayer, and before that, a closing song. After our closing prayer, we have, uh, as is our uh, schedule here, for those not familiar, we have our Bible class directly after this service, and then after our Bible class, we have our second and our final service of today. And I invite you to stay for both of those things. In the adult class, which is in the building directly behind this one, uh, Brother B.J. Clark will be having our class period time uh, there. We're looking forward to that. Uh, there are classes for all ages in this building and in the building directly behind us uh, here. So I invite you to stay and find a class where the Word of God will be taught and focused upon. And then uh, look forward to you coming and staying with us and, uh, in our second and our final service today. If you would please stand, we'll sing number 708, Walking in Sunlight. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep vale Jesus has said I'll never forsake thee promise divine that never can fail heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight flooding my soul with glory 
sunlight ever rejoicing pressing my way to mansions above singing his praises gladly i'm walking walking in sunlight sunlight of love heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight flooding my soul with glory divine Ain't you glad you made it here this morning? I'm telling you right now. You know, I don't, I don't mean to be bragging, but we have the best of the best. Twofold. And if you don't believe me, stick around. We got one more. You'll find out. And don't worry about it. They're going to be here. We got them under lifetime contract. <laughs> I mean, let's bow, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this beautiful, beautiful day that you give us. We thank you for the great opportunity to be here and to sing these songs of praises to hear your word presented to us. Father, we thank you so very much for your son Jesus, for his love for us, to leave his home and come to this earth and live a perfect life as an example for us. Then to give that life that we might have the opportunity for eternal life with you and with him. Father, we know that we have many that are sick in this congregation. We pray that you will be with them, be with the doctors that care for them, that they might do just the right thing. We especially pray for little Christian Montague this morning and his family. Father, we're so thankful that we have some that are back with us that hadn't been here for several weeks due to illness. We're so thankful. Brother Anna, Brother Bernice can be here with us. Father, we just thank you so much for all the many blessings that you give us each, each and every day. Now, as we Go to our classes. We pray that we will all learn much from it and return back to hear another message from thy word. Forgive us of our sins, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.